Hello and welcome. It is time for another solar production update. In August of 2017, I installed a solar array on the roof of my house. And if you're interested in seeing a video that breaks down all the costs to do that, I'll put a card here just above. Now, in 2019, we expanded on that system, and so I added an, an additional 3.6 kilowatts, and I'll put another card here to that video. And now, fast forward, those two systems combined have now produced 50 megawatt hours, or 50,000 kilowatt hours. And if you were to just use the average of 10 cents per kilowatt hour, that would translate to uh, $5,000, right? Um, now, in my case, I've done some research here in Utah where I live, and it appears that the general average price for uh, electricity is 10.9 cents per kilowatt hour. So those are the figures that I'm going off of here. So if you look here on my screen, it's showing our lifetime revenue now is at $5,447.95 at 50 megawatt hours of energy production. The first question that everybody always asks is, okay, so how soon will you break even? So let's do a couple of calculations here. Uh, so my combined system cost was $9,755.04, and that is for a total system size of 9.98 .9 kilowatts. And so based on the 16,580 kilowatt hours that the system produced in 2020 specifically, uh, and the reason why I'm using that is because it's the first full year that we have of production from this full-sized array that we now have that is 9.98 kilowatts. And so I want to be using its production going forward to estimate how much energy we'll be producing. And so that was 45.42 kilowatt hours per day on average in 2020. And that translates to $4.95 worth of electricity per day on average in 2020 that the system produced. And so uh, with the total cost of that $9,755 uh, minus the $5,447.95 that the system has produced so far, that means we now have a remaining balance of $4,307.09. And uh, that is to, to pay off the system completely. We paid for the system with cash. So at this point, it's just us paying ourselves back, basically knowing that from that point forward, it is genuinely free for us to have electricity. And keep in mind, this electricity is not only powering just our home, but it's also powering our vehicles. Uh, right now, we only have one Tesla Model S. Previously, we had a Nissan Leaf as well. Uh, and in the future, we'll have a Tesla Cybertruck in addition to the Model S. The production of this should be covering the needs for our house and these vehicles, but obviously it depends on how much we're driving. That means we have 870 days remaining to pay off the whole system or 2.38 years remaining. And so that also means that the final time to break even from the very beginning of August 15th of 2017, uh, all the way through to when we break even will be 2,243 days or 73.75 months or 6.14 years to break even. And that means that on October 6th of 2023, we will be breaking even on the system. And I'll be making a YouTube video at that time probably so that we can see exactly what that date is. But this is a pretty good data set to base our prediction off of. And so it's looking really promising that that's when we're actually going to be breaking even. So I share these numbers just to give you a real world example of uh, what is possible potentially with a solar array. Uh, keep in mind, we are grid tied. We do not have battery backup. Uh, and like I mentioned in my previous videos, you know, I did this installation largely myself, but I did hire out some parts of it. it. This is too complicated of a system and it's too nuanced based on your region and what your electricity costs are and stuff like that to have any sure number of what you will actually experience. But this is what we're experiencing. I'm trying to give you as real uh, as exact numbers as I can to what we have experienced, uh, just to give you a ballpark figure of what you might be able to experience yourself. With all of those high-level uh, break-even and, and production figures out of the way, uh, why don't I just go ahead and show you a little bit here in the Solar Edge monitoring portal what our actual production has been uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, so right now I am showing the power and energy production over uh, the, the, by the year. And if we look down here, this graph is showing us 2020. Uh, if we jump forward and we look here at 2021, this is what it has been looking like so far. Uh, so this, this is a partial year, obviously, so it's not very useful. And this May is even a partial month. But in May, we've so far produced 1.1 uh, megawatt hours. And today is May 19th 
Uh, so we're two thirds of the way through the month. If we look at 2020, uh, we can see that the, the, the highest product producing month was in July. And it, you know, I've noticed that from year to year, it actually is varying and just depends on the weather. So you really can't expect any one particular month to always be the highest producing. Uh, what's interesting is that May in 2020 had the highest producing individual day in the whole year. Um, but J July was consistently sunnier and so the overall it produced more. Uh, keep in mind solar panels produce more when they are cool. And so often May has some pretty cold days, but the sun is clear and it, the days are getting longer. So there's more time to be producing electricity. So that's often why May produces so well. And then June in 2020 just happened to be pretty cloudy. Now on, on this graph, on any of these days uh, or months, we can click on this uh, column and it'll bring us into the month, showing us each, each of the individual days in that month. So you can see kind of what that looks like. This right here, 70.107 kilowatt hours on May 7th of 2020 was our highest producing day of all time. Now, if we jump over here to, uh, let's see, let's go to May of 2021 um, because we're in that month right now and we can at least see what we've done so far. And we can see right here, we have 70.11 kilowatt hours. And so that is tied pretty much with the exact same day uh, as a, a production as that day in 2021. And ironically, this is May 8th when it is producing so well. And if we go over here to uh, that high day in 2020, it is May 7th. And so uh, this one you can see is 20.107. And over here in 2021, it is 20.11. So this one is virtually the same, but it's just a tiny bit more and they are one day apart. And so it's just interesting how the weather happened, but that, that is, I think probably going to be based on last year anyway, but that's going to be our highest producing day in the, the all, all of the year of 2021. So if we pull back out to the year and we jump back to 2019, uh, this is not as helpful of a year to look at because right here in actually it was the end of July when we installed the additional solar panels. And so you can see the August production jumped up dramatically because it was about a 33% you know, increase in system size. And then it continued on higher up at this point. Uh, but you can kind of see over here that, you know, before the system size changed, it was actually marching upwards in production, you know, March, uh, and then April, May, June, all of those months were marching upwards. Whereas in the following year, uh, June actually dropped down. Uh, and, and those system sizes are the same between those months. So that's just, like I said, the subtle nuances. Also January and February, you see February is much, much higher in uh, 2020. But if we go to 2019, the system size between January and February was the same size. It was a 6.38 kilowatt system and yet went down in February. So that's just the difference in weather product, uh, from year to year. And so let's jump to 2018. So this was an entire year of the system not changing and it was a 6.38 kilowatt array. And here you can see that in February it dipped down again that year as well and then started jumping up dramatically in March, April, May, June, and it continued to climb throughout uh, the spring, midsummer, and then started coming down. And then interestingly here, September was actually higher than October. So uh, that's just slight differences, like I said. If we jump to 2019, uh, S September to October was identical, actually 1.507, perfectly identical. So kind of interesting. And then if we go to 2017, uh, we can see that's when the system went online was halfway through the month of August. And then it um, produced this much for the following months. If we go down to the bottom of this, it will show us our comparative energy over the course of all of these years. And so you, this is kind of hard to look at. You have to study it a little bit, but if you look at the colors, you can see that these columns down here are the, the different years. And because the system size has changed once through its lifespan, it's a little bit makes this graph harder to look at because of, of that change. But 2019 is red. And so you can see that the red bars here are going up and then you can see it jump up and that's when the system size gets bigger. And then that kind of ramps down. And then 2020 is now blue. So we're paying attention to blue and that's consistent all the way across, um, meaning the system didn't change. And then in 2021, also it didn't change and we're partially through the year. Uh, we can also do comparative energy by the quarter and then we can do comparative energy uh, in individual years. And so here we can compare 2020 
to 2021 when it's done, but right now these all these bars actually stand alone. This system was a partial year, this system was a complete year, but a smaller system. 2019 was a changed year, 2020 was a uh, unchanged year, but it was a diff different system size than 2018, and then 2021 is a partial year still. Uh, so when we get done with 2021, I'll be able to do a comparison, if you're interested, seeing the difference between the production of 2020 and 2021, system size will be the same. If we go up here to the top, uh, just as a side note, just the Solar Edge monitoring portal and how it works, uh, we can look at the billing cycle, and we can uh, the billing cycle for me is usually around the 25th of the month, and so it allows us to look at that chunk of time specifically rather than the calendar month. I don't really use this overly much. We'll just go to today, and so we can see uh, this is this week. Um, we can look at last week, so this is just another graph, and it gives you an idea of uh, perfectly sunny days look like that, and then the cloudy days are, are all broken up and spiky because of that. Now, one thing you might find is interesting, if we go here to day, and we go to uh, May 8th of 2021, that was that fully sunny day, you might notice that there is a flat top here and wonder what that is. Uh, so this is called clipping. And what, what it is is our inverter, we have a st single str string inverter, it's rated for 7.6 kilowatts. And yet our system size is closer to 10 kilowatts, and you might think that that not, shouldn't happen, but this is a good thing. The inverter produces more, it's more efficient when it's under load. And so it's better to have a larger array to handle all of the times when it's uh, the sun is light is ramping up in the morning and ramping down in the evening or just cloudy days. It's better to have a larger solar array giving more energy to that smaller string inverter uh, so that it can uh, function more optimally. And in simulators, it has been shown that it's a good idea to oversize your array uh, roughly 30% over the rate and maximum of the inverter. And the inverters are, are built to be able to handle this. I can't remember exactly what the specifics are of mine, but it can actually go just a little bit over what mine currently is. So what this does is when it gets to the actual, when the solar array is actually producing more than the inverter can handle, it just clips it. It just doesn't invert and you lose that energy, yes. So this normally would have a little bit of an arc there that I'm losing. And you can see it's peaking at right around 7.9 uh, kilowatts. It's interesting that a 7.6 kilowatt inverter can get to 7.9, but it, it can. Uh, it looks like the highest of the air is 7.11, 7.911. And uh, so you lose out on that energy on those particularly sunny days, but that net loss is actually not very much compared to how much you gain the rest of the year when it's cloudy and, and suboptimal. And it's only these days in May that tend to get those flat tops. Um, later in the season when it's hotter, it has a hard time getting to that. And so you have just a tiny little flat top and you barely miss out on anything at all. As an example, if you look here at September 1st of 2020, it ramps up smoothly and at the very, very peak, it gets to 7.759 kilowatt hours, but never actually gets to the point where the inverter starts to clip. One more thing that might be interesting to see is the actual individual panel um, production. So if we go over here to layout and we're looking at the total production right here, we can see the array on the right is the older one from 2017, and the one on the left is the newer one that got added in 2019. Also, the differences would be the panels on the right are 290 watt uh, panels, and the ones on the left are 300 watt panels. So uh, they aren't all the same here. So looking at the total production though, we can see that each panel on the right has produced 1.83 megawatt hours, and the ones on the left have produced about 870 uh, watt hours, or sorry, kilowatt hours per panel. Now, if we switch here to, we say yearly, and just look at 2021 by itself, so they're all the same, same time frame, um, but the ones on the left are a little bit larger, just barely. Uh, we can see that their production is nearly identical, regardless, uh, even though they're just a tiny bit size in their rating differences. What's also interesting is the ones on the left are monocrystalline panels, and the right are polycrystalline panels. And so the ones on the left supposedly do better and a little bit better in heat and stuff like that. But looking at this real world production, it doesn't seem to really even matter. Uh, all of these have no shading on them. They all have no shading any time of the day. So it's just kind of interesting to see here in my own little personal experiment that the monocrystalline polycrystalline doesn't really seem to matter in this context on my particular roof for whatever reason. And with that, uh, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.